Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's been, it's really great. I'm um, based in Warwick, Queensland. We live on our family farm. We're regenerative agricultural farmers. I've been an accredited professional educator with the Savory Institute since 2003 and training families and individuals and companies and organisations in uh, values-based decision-making, holistic management um, in that time. So, and I've uh, just distilled and uh, one of my COVID projects was to distill the decision-making process in holistic management down into something that um, urban people can digest and uh, get excited about and get involved in. Um, so uh, just uh, keeping it, keeping the language, getting the language a little bit more simple, I guess, and, you know, less agriculture. So, uh, so we, uh, I just wanted to work through with you today, um, just the essence of, of why we have to, like, how we can actually change the outcomes of the decisions we're making by simply updating our decision making process. Um, and I want to just give you some background about that. So I just, um, just drink that down. And so Ultimately, the decision design process, so the name is decision design, came about because a decision is fairly, um, you know, when we say we're going to make a decision, that, that is fairly um, based on our individual or a bit of a silo focus, single focus. But I wanted to add the design because actually the design is about understanding needs. It's the considering the situation. And as, as incorporation of the design thinking, we empathize, define, brainstorm, prototype and test. And that is actually the process in which we actually make decisions through the decision design hub. Um, and, and it's really through the uh, holistic management framework that we use, uh, which includes a life context and then 10 good questions, the 10 good questions that actually evaluate options towards our life context. But before we get to that point, I want to actually just back up and actually give you some of the background about why we, why we need to, what we need to tweak uh, in order to be better at getting those outcomes. And similar to what uh, Mick was talking about, that personal growth, that personal point of change. Um, and this is this point of, unless we get this sorted, um, all our outcomes will continue to be, um, you know, inconsistently um, inconsistent results and, and some good, some not so good. Uh, and so we have to actually get this tweaked before we're actually going to have ongoing and consistent results that actually do, do improve their well-being and mitigate that, that climate emergency. So if with, we look at this list, we are very good at making things. Now humans, we have consistent results when we make things. However, we have inconsistent results when we manage things. And so this is where the area, and I mean, the agriculture, landscape management, human relationships, and then also our prosperity or economics, that's a classic, they're classic areas where we have inconsistent results. Um, and the difference between them is of course, when we make things, it's a linear process. It's complicated, but it's linear. And then with, when we actually talk about people, environment and prosperity, it's actually holistic and complex. So we're great at complicated and we have inconsistent results with complex. But to keep making things, we need to include the complex in management and decisions. And so I'd really, um, this is what I'm, where I'm heading on this, on this topic. So for us to do that, for us to think about people, to manage this complexity, uh, we've got what do people, when we thrive, okay, these are the things we can consider about people our relationships and values, our community and work teams, the creativity and labor, a sense of belonging, common ground, personalities and culture, knowledge, skills, understanding attitude and approaches, accommodating, not compromise, volunteering and sharing, respect, love, diversity and enjoyment. Um, the critical key point I want to make here is values. It's the one thing that brings us together it provides us with common ground to connect and focus on an outcome bigger than ourselves. So if we come together as a group, if we actually can, can, can actually articulate our values of why we're involved in the group or, you know, and, or what's important to us about being in the family, all those, that, those values, those core values, we then have a reference point to actually work, you know, to use in our decision making to ensure that decisions are moving us towards our values. And, and in this also, in our, uh, our life context, uh, we would be developing our preferred future as well and describing what our preferred future in line with our values has to look like. 
And so there's two parts to the life context that we use as the reference point for decision making. So next, the next area, of course, that we need to in, improve or understand uh, better so it can thrive is the environment. Um, and that's where, you know, we really do need to have a think about it. So this is going to throw up maybe some different ideas that you may, you know, you may want to contend with. But please just say maybe um, if there's something that you that I say that you don't agree with, um, we can have a discussion later in the questions. So for the environment to thrive, what do we have to consider? Well, given that everything we eat, buy, and use and consume is derived from the earth at some point in its life cycle, um, we have to consider the impact on the four functions that underpin our life. Now, the, uh, the four functions um, are at soil surface and below. They are the water cycle, the mineral cycle, the energy flow or sunlight capture, and then diversity. Those four areas are paramount. Like without, without them functioning, you know, we really we have bigger droughts, bigger floods. Um, and so this is where the rubber hits the road in regards to our decisions and our policies and our practices that we implement. And so we need to really be very aware of these four functions and how our, imp our decisions or our, the tools that we use to manage impact them significantly. So, and obviously I've just gone through there at their best. Okay, the water, soil holds moisture. So we reduce evaporation, reduce runoff. The mineral cycle and feed all the critters and feed the roots of the, of the plants. Sunlight captures bringing root energy and capturing that sunlight into the ground. We want big, broad leaf. We want lots of green leaf everywhere. We want good ground cover. And then the diversity is all the different diversity of age and structure of plants and animals below and above the soil. So that's you know, in a really simple nutshell. If we can achieve that, if we can achieve that highly functioning ecosystem processes or the four functions for life, then we are winning. We will start to win the, the game. So ultimately what we have to do then is understand there's another element to this which actually impacts what, how we do that, how we look after those four functions in these two different environments. In the world, we have two different types of environments. We have a brittle tending, which is a dry seasonal rainfall, which is two thirds of the world's surface. And we have a humid environment, uh, which is you know, moist throughout the year and the humidity is at soil surface throughout the year. And there's one third of the earth's surface that is that environment. So these two different, you know, two different environments, we apply the same management tools in the same way, we can get very different results. And I'll go into that just now. So we have to tweak the management tool to ensure it's appropriately used in the right environment, in, in either a brittle tending or environment or a non-brittle environment. So um, with, with that, and I will go into the, um, the tools a bit later, I'll just go through this prosperity. So the third area is prosperity, prosperity when it thrives. So what do we have to consider? So we have the profit, money, risk, debt, security, control, um, freedom, long-term legacy, time invested, money returns, source of money, use of money, source of energy, use of energy, business management, decisions in line with our values, what we buy, how is it grown or made, long-term health and our well-being. So the prosperity encompasses more than just money. It's about our legacy, our longer term, the consequences and our, what we're leaving, I guess, and, and what we're growing uh, while, we're, while we're busy operating and living and being, being part of the Earth's community. So the consequences of the tools we use to manage. So we have three resources. Any one of these is needed to take any action. They're ideas, human creativity, money, and we need effort and labour. All right, then we add to that. So we pick up one of these or a few of these and, but to actually make any change, we actually need to pick up um, a physical tool. And that forms in the group of technology, time and living organisms. So there are only three main uh, tools that we have available to us as humans that we can actually you know, make impact on our earth surface. And in particularly, I guess, those four functions for life. Um, but even in our life generally. So I'll go into that now and we'll, we'll look at each of these tools and I'll give you the, you can read the slides and I'm happy to provide a copy of the slides, but you know, I, because I've, we've got limited time, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what, uh, of what we're trying to cover here and, and think about. 
So for example, the technology. So when we pick up the tool for technology, and I'm talking, this could be from a match to a spaceship, right? So we have a lots and lots of tools which fall into the group of technology, our houses, our desks, whatever. Okay, we have anything man-made is um, technology. All right, so we've got enormous amounts of tools in the technology bag um, within the toolbox. But for people, we really need to consider key things, okay? Is it improving our health? Is it improving our connections? What about the impact on the environment, the inputs, the waste, the root cause? What about recycling? Is it ma making life easier and more comfortable? Okay, that's certainly, and that's gonna be different for everyone. But then with the environment, these are the, the, the key things with the environment. If we are going to actually make a change and improve the ability for those four functions of life to thrive, if technology is used in our environment, either or in either environment, we need to make sure that does it keep the ground covered? Does it solve the root cause? And is it increasing the biology of the soil? And those are the three key areas. And if we, use a, if we use a match for fire, we are losing that carbon to all that carbon to carbon and it goes into carbon dioxide and we're losing it to the atmosphere. And so fire is a really key issue we have in regards to as a tool and we use it too readily uh, without understanding the consequences of that. And so then we move to prosperity and the, the, and the role of technology or to, for prosperity to be considered. We need to think about our habits and our addictions with technology. Um, is it for enjoyment, fun and hobbies and well-being, Or is there, are there opportunities, growth areas, new careers and the circular economy? Um, will it enable those things? Will it enable uh, recycling and really be able to recycle all those plastics that we've got in shipping containers? Will it be able to do great things for us so that we can actually make a change and transition to a new economy? So that's, that's the, the, rule, the tool of technology, but I just go back to that environmental piece. Those three key questions have to be asked when we use technology, okay? The time, okay, time is a tool. So we use that, we, we use it to people, we manage it. We have 168 hours every week. How do we use our time? How do we manage our time? So it's a tool that we use every day. We use it for healing, we use it for growing things, we use it for harvest. Um, it can't happen at the same time. Um, and so time is really, really valuable. Time, however, for the environment is something that is absolutely critical. In a dry environment, if we lock country up, it will get gray and oxidized and send that carbon, all that green, all that grass gets gray and now moves away from a decay process to a chemical process and sends carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so we are actually causing grit problems when we lock country up in a dry environment. In a humid environment, it actually restores the landscape. It actually gets everything going and, and it just um, blossoms. But what we really need to do is realize that when we lock country up in a dry environment, we create Food, fire, fire, um, you know, fire body. And so hence, you know, the bushfires and just run through it and cause devastation everywhere. So we really need to understand we have to manage that with another tool to actually, um, without fire and, and without locking up. So there's another tool coming in living organisms that we can manage dry environments um, and ensure that we cycle that carbon because grasses don't defoliate themselves. They actually need animals to graze them and, and cycle the carbon back into the soil surface. And I'll get that, get that to that next time. So in time with prosperity, we use time for prosperity for, um, for the relationships and connections over time. We have legacy, there's compounding interest, there's making plans a reality. And there's again, the circular economy and, and actually taking the time to do that. With the life organisms, so that's our third tool that we have available to us. Um, we use it every day as people. We need food three times a day. That's a living, a living item like this, uh, you know, fruit and veggies and meat and whatever else. And then we have um, the food health, live cultures. We have garden health. We have compost, manures, fertilizers, worm tea, you know, compost teas, worm farms, chooks. Um, flowers and bees. So there's living organisms everywhere in our life as people. Um, we have um, the environment. So increasing diversity in our environment equals more stability. Um, and, and the tools of living organisms really impact our, our four functions for life in that diversity sphere particularly. Um, and if everything's thriving, our water cycle, our mineral cycle, and our energy flow is thriving, our diversity will also thrive. 
But I talk about this environment with living organisms because there are large living organisms that are critical tools and they are livestock. Any livestock that we have in a dry environment when they manage properly and moved around onto fresh feed and not they don't come back to that paddock until they're fully, it's fully recovered, either restoring the environment, it's actually cycling the carbon and putting it back into the earth in the form that microbes can use. It's the only tool we have available to us in a dry environment to restore our landscape. Absolutely critical. We have to be properly managed with moving it around as a, as, and mimicking the herds that used to be moved around by lions and predators, but we do it with electric fence and, and other fencing. But the point is if we properly manage livestock, we could run them through our state forests and restore those landscapes and make them vibrant and thriving rather than deserts of trees. We can do it with landscapes in farming country. We can do it in local councils to manage the roadsides. We could actually be cycling the carbon back into the soil and improving our landscape function, particularly in dry environments. In a non-brittle environment, in wet and moist areas, the grazing management and, and moving at planned grazing will actually enhance the diversity within the species. What happens in dry, in wet environments and humid environments when they don't have cycling of the carbon and animals are allowed to just set stock and, and graze forever in the same paddock, they lose their diversity of their species. And so by planning our grazing, it's a critical tool available to us in, in uh, landscape management and ensuring those ecosystem processes fully function, those four functions for life thrive, and we need to use this tool wisely. Then prosperity, we also have, like the, I guess it's nutrient integrity of our food and the diversity and st equals stability. So it's the bigger picture of what living organisms, organisms give us in our, in our life and, and our, in our environment around us. Um, and when well managed, we have healthy soil, healthy food and healthy humans and abundance. One of the things I, I picked up on with this nutrient integrity um, is the fact that it's actually about clean soil, clean grass, clean animals. That's nutrient integrity. Um, and, and so by, by actually as consumers, with every dollar we spend, we are choosing to support the way in which our food is produced. Um, and so whether or not you're in landscape function or not, um, every day when you spend your dollar, you're impacting and deciding to support practices, that, you know, because of the way in which that food or that product that you're purchasing is, is, is made or where it's made from. So managing complexity. Uh, um, if we are, we really need to take a long-term interest to get better at including the complexity of dynamic of people, environment, prosperity in our decisions. Like we update our software and our computers, we can update our decision making to get better outcomes. So we currently operate in a linear process. We have an objectives, we have a problem we want to solve, a desire, we, or an outcome we want to get. We have a toolbox. Yes, we have time and technology and some living organisms, often not considered as a tool though. We have source of ideas. So we bring a whole heap of ideas in from all sorts of areas and all our life experiences. But when we actually go to actually sort out, sort those ideas out, we debate them and we work out the pros versus the cons. Usually it's decided by a vote. And then there's a monitoring and we kind of assume we're right most times. You know, this is a linear decision-making process that we use everywhere and we are linear in our, in our wiring. So we are, as humans, we default to this quite easily. It enables the complicated tasks that we talked about earlier, um, but doesn't manage the complexity. Um, and it's a win-lose. Um, it can be reactive. And one thing I also pick up um, that it is um, you've got to compromise. So there's a compromise in this. People have to compromise when they go through that process and when we go through that linear decision-making. So, so the holistic decisions, we add a few steps. We un add an understanding so that we, our linear brain gets you know, is satisfied. We define what we're managing. Um, we, we create a life context, which includes our values and our preferred future. We then understand the environmental functions. We understand those four functions for life and what tools will make them work and thrive. We, yeah, we certainly have objectives. We, 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 everything else stays the same until we get down to the brainstorm session. We get the brainstorm of all the ideas of how we might solve the problem or fix the thing or make something happen. We then use the decision tool, which has 10, the 10 good questions. They check our head, our heart, the future, the present, the root cause. 
and then people, environment and prosperity. And so they really are really key questions that enable us to ensure that every decision we're making is improving and including and considering people, environment and prosperity. And then from there, we monitor and, and not with people, but with environment, particularly because it's so complex, we are unlikely to understand it all at any given time. And so we actually monitor and we actually think, well, what's the earliest sign that we could be on the wrong track? Let's, let's make sure that we check that and stay on track. It's like the plane being off course 90% of the time. It's only the minor adjustments the pilot makes uh, that actually allows us to get from A to B. And so if we do that, we're being really on our toes and we're being nimble and we're being adjust we're ever adjusting and, and uh, enhancing how we're going. And the outcome then, it enables our complicated tasks and helps manage the complexity that we really need if we want to keep making things. And as humans, of course, we're going to keep making things. Let's just do it better. And then it addresses the root cause it's inclusive, it's proactive, and best of all, it actually accommodates everyone because those values, we all want our values accommodated and we actually want to um, ensure that um, you know, those values are that common ground, they glue us together, they, they make us think bigger than ourselves. And so it allows us to accommodate people's values rather than having people winning and losing. So to review, um, the decision design is the antidote to wicked problems. And many of you may have been across the systems thinking processes and, and wicked problems come up as, as something that's of concern. This decision design process is the antidote to those wicked problems. It means we can solve the wicked problems and we can, we can manage them. We find making easier than managing. For longevity of making, we need to improve our capacity to enable um, and rely on what is being managed to thrive. We can get better results by creating the right conditions for people, environment, prosperity to thrive. Um, our management tools and how we apply them determine those conditions. And by updating our decision making to decision design, we can consider the consequences for people, environment and prosperity all at the same time. And we can ensure better results more consistently. So with every decision we make towards our values, we create gentle ripples that over time become a wave of change for a better future. So thank you. You can um, check out my work at decisiondesignhub.com.au. I'm a professional educator, LinkedIn. You can join with me on LinkedIn. I have a pep talk you can download from our website. Uh, and there's also some online courses. And in the new year, I'll be uh, you know, doing some web webinars. Uh, so if you're interested, you can you know, just send me an email. Um, but yes, yeah, so we do workshops for individuals, families, teams, policy, governments, boards, whoever. Thank you.